numbers this morning. Turn in your Bible please to Mark chapter 6. The book of Mark chapter 6. I do trust that you'll be back with us tonight in the evening service. Come pray with us at 6 o'clock, both men and women. And then in the evening service and we're in the book of Revelation and we're in chapter 5. Last week in chapter 4 we saw that the church was finally at rest in heaven. Finally resting with the Lord. But we saw that that's not the end. We saw that the judgment seat of Christ had taken place. The 24 elders and the four beasts had received their crowns. And they had cast those crowns at the feet of the Lord. Now they were ready to serve Him throughout the endless ages of eternity. But now we'll come to chapter 5 tonight and something is going on in heaven that's very, very important. There's a book that is brought forth. And the theme of that book is redemption. A search is made in heaven to see if there is anyone who can open that book and reveal the contents and then a decision made about that book. And if you don't get chapter 5 of Revelation right, you'll miss the rest of the book. And so I trust that you'll study with us tonight at 5 o'clock in the evening service. Also, uh, tonight Brother Johnny is going to give us a report out in our parking lot, uh, as most of you know, they've been here a long time. A few years ago, uh, we had a, a gas uh, situation out there. We thought all of that was resolved, and then we found out that it was not. And so Brother Johnny and Brother Drew and others have been working hard to clear this up, and he'll give you a report tonight on where we stand. Now turn in your Bible to Mark 6, verses 1 through 6. Without honor in his own country. Without honor in his own country. Mark 6, beginning in verse 1. And he went out from thence and came into his own country. You might want to underscore that. Uh, there have been some men that have gone back to their home church and have done a good job. Jerry Falwell did that uh, and some others. But for the most part, uh, usually you're more important when you're away from home. A little girl went out to South Dakota and had a great success in a children's ministry. And she came back home and she said, I guess my words are more important out there than they are back here. And there's something about going away from home and ministering. And so Jesus was in His own country. And you might want to circle that, His own country. And His disciples follow Him. And when the Sabbath day was come, He began to teach in the synagogue. And many hearing Him were astonished, saying, from whence hath this man these things? And what wisdom is this, 
which is given unto him, that even such mighty works are wrought by his hand. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph, and of Judah and Simeon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is without honor, or has less honor, but in his own country and among his own kin and in his own house. And he could there do no mighty works, save that he laid his hands upon a few sick folk and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief and went around the villages teaching. Have you ever made a misjudgment about someone or something? Have you ever looked at someone and you thought, you know, that's a real sourpuss? I mean, just got a scowl on his face, a scowl on her face all of the time, just real sour. I don't want to know him. But then after you took time to know the individual and got acquainted with them, you discovered that your first impression was wrong, that that individual was very kind and very gracious and very sweet. And you didn't understand what the years had wrought in their life. You didn't understand what had happened to them and how their heart had been affected, and how their emotions had been affected through others. But you got close to them, and you discovered that your judgment was wrong. Or perhaps you took a look at someone and you said, you know, that is probably one of the most spiritual individuals that I've ever met in my life. Uh, that man loves the Lord. That woman loves the Lord. Look at how they worship. Look at the expression on their faces. They may lift their hand. They may be bowing in prayer. And you think that individual is close to God. But then you got close to them and you discovered that the opposite was true. What you saw on the outside was not really true. What you saw was a, a facade and there was no depth to the life of this individual. Or perhaps you looked at someone and you said, you know, there's not much about that guy that's spiritual. There's not much about that guy that uh, merits the goodness of God. There's not real quality uh, in his life and look at this and that. And then you found out that that man or that woman did walk with God. And you found out that maybe just because they weren't in your group or they didn't see things exactly the way that you saw them, but you got close to them and you discovered that that individual really did love the Lord Jesus Christ. It could very well be that you started out with someone and you figured that you would never be friends, but they ended up being one of your best friends and ended up being a lifelong friends. Uh, there's been some tremendous mistakes and judgment down through the years. For instance, in 1997, Thomas Watson said this. He was with IBM. I think that there's only a market for five computers in the whole world. Can you imagine that? IBM. And he said, maybe only five computers. Also in 1997, Sam Olison said, uh, in a few years, there will only be a few computers in everyone's home. People don't want a computer in their home. And then listen to this. I'm glad that it's Clark Gable and not Gary Cooper who's going to fall on his face this was Gary Cooper and his decision to turn down the lead role to Gone with the Wind. A misjudgment. We make misjudgments, don't we? Jesus had come back to his own country. And when he came back to his own country, he was not welcomed. He was not received. As a matter of fact, only a few miracles were done there. Only a few miracles. Great works were done there. Look in verse 2. And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogues. Let me pause there a moment. We don't worship in the synagogue on Saturday on the Sabbath. The Sabbath is for the Jews. Have you got that? The Sabbath is for the Jews. The Sabbath was for the age of the law. It is not for the church. It is not for believers. Believers meet on the Lord's day. There is not one command in the Bible for a Gentile to worship on the Sabbath. 
It's for the Jew. It is a sign between God and the Jew. We don't worship on the Sabbath, but we do worship on the Lord's Day. But when the Sabbath was the day of worship, Jesus was there in the synagogue on the Sabbath teaching. And the Bible said it was His custom. He was, had a habit of doing that. I believe you and I ought to be in a habit of being in God's house on Sunday. In the Lord's, on the Lord's day, in His house, worshiping the Lord. It's what Jesus did. If it's good enough for Him, it's good enough for me. But read on. He began to teach in the synagogue, and many hearing Him were astonished. Now to just look at that word astonished, you don't get the full picture. If you look at the word astonished in the Greek, it has a much deeper meaning. You know what it really means? They were shocked to the point of almost panicking. Now that puts a deeper thought on it, doesn't it? Here is His own country, Nazareth, His own people. They watch Him, they hear Him, and they were astonished. They literally panicked. They were in shock that this person that had been with them for more than 30 years could do what He had done, and they would not listen to Him because of that. They made a mistake in judgment. Notice what they said. First of all, they said, He's just a common man. That's all He is. And yet, before them was the Lord of glory. And yet, before them was the one that spoke the world into existence. Can you imagine? Let there be light, and there was light. And the one that created what you and I see, the sun and the stars and the galaxies and this earth that we live upon, the rivers and the oceans, the one that formed it with His own hands, the one that formed it with His own mouth, walked in His own country, and they were shocked that He was able to do that. Why, this is just an ordinary man. Let me say something to you this morning. Never, ever misjudge what God can do with a young man or a young lady regardless of their background. You might be fooled. God may have something in mind totally different than what you have in mind for an individual. I think I've told you before, in my freshman years at Tennessee Temple, there was a man by the name of Wilbur Crosby. He failed every course that Tennessee Temple had to offer. And he would go downtown in Chattanooga and stand on the street corner in Chattanooga of a morning in rush hour, of an evening in rush hour, and hold up the Bible and say, you must be born again. People laughed at him. And uh, I lost contact with him for a while. And later on I discovered that in his earlier years, uh, yes, he had had some problems emotionally. And he was not as stable as he should. But all of that ended. All of that went up by the wayside, and his faculties all came back to him and has been pastoring and preaching for many years now. And you would have said, why, well, he's a fluke. There's nothing about him that's any good at all. There's nothing about him that would draw me to him as a preacher or anything else. And people made a mistake. They said, this is just a common man. Then they said, this is just, this is the carpenter. We know him. He's been with us 30 some odd years. He is a carpenter. We've watched him every day in the carpenter shop. Now the word carpenter here in the Greek is literally craftsman. Jesus was a craftsman. Now I want you to think with me. When Jesus was at home, he was a craftsman. Until he stepped out on the scene and uh, said before the people, I am the Messiah, and John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. He was a craftsman. Yes, he was a common man, but he was a craftsman. He could build anything from a hole to a house. You see, in those days, craftsmen could build anything. And if you wanted to build something simple, you would go to him. If you wanted a home built, you would go to him. Jesus was a craftsman. History says that he was about six foot tall and weighed 200 pounds and very muscular and very powerful. This tells me that Jesus wasn't a wimp. He was a man, all man, through and through, and a craftsman. And what he did, he did it well. And what he did, he did it right. 
And then they said, why, he's just uh, an honest, uh, he's just a common citizen. Uh, that's all he is. Now think with me for just a moment. Here is the sovereign God. I know God the Father is in heaven. I know Jesus is God too. But I, I understand all of that. But think with me for just a moment. He didn't leave home until it was time for him to leave home. And up until the time God the Father said it's time for you to present yourself as the Messiah, he was a craftsman, and they said, listen to this, is not this the son of Mary? They didn't say he's the son of Joseph. You know why? Because history tells us that Joseph died when Jesus was a very young age. Somebody had to take care of mother, brothers, and sisters. Listen to me, Jesus didn't leave until his brothers and sisters were old enough to take care of Mary and to take care of business at home, and then he left. That's the human side of our Savior. That's the human aspect of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he left. Watch now. In his own country, he was not accepted. As a matter of fact, Luke chapter 4 tells us that they attempted to kill him in his own country. What a blatant misjudgment. His own kin would not accept him. According to Mark chapter 3, uh, his friends and his neighbors, they thought that he was insane to say that he was the Son of God, to say that he was the Messiah. And the Bible says that's why that they were astonished. That's why they said, uh, we're going into a panic here. Uh, we don't understand this. And the Bible says in verse 3 that they were offended at him, which means to fall away, they went away from him. What misjudgment uh, can you see uh, in the mistakes of these people? But wait a minute. In his own house, they were embarrassed because of his claims. What if your brother that you watched as a craftsman every day all of a sudden one day stepped out in the front of a nation and said, I'm your Messiah? Now the Bible says that he was obedient to his parents. Remember when he was 12 years old, he went back home, he lived with them, and he was obedient unto them. And the Bible says Jesus increased in wisdom and in favor and in stature and in favor with God and man. So while he was at home, there was nothing that he did that could cause people to think that he was not holy or righteous or good, but they just would not listen to him. But the real reason, listen, men may say one thing, but most of the time, they don't tell you what's really in their heart. You live long enough, young people, you'll discover that. I've noticed that down through the years. I've watched people leave the church and tell you why they left church, and that wasn't the real reason. There was some other reason that they didn't want to reveal to you because maybe it might reveal their ignorance or their lack of spirituality. But these people wouldn't accept Jesus and it was because of their jealousy of him. Now, I want you to watch real carefully with me. They made a misjudgment. They made a mistake. And because they made this mistake, they dishonored him. And because they dishonored him, they cut themselves off from his blessings. Are you listening to me today? Let's bring this right down to where we live in 2004. There are many believers in fundamental independent Baptist churches just like ours who have become too familiar with the things of God and have become too familiar with our Lord Jesus Christ. They didn't mean as much to Him as He used to mean to them. And so as a result of that, they have cut themselves off from His blessings and they've dishonored Him because they've become too familiar with the things of God. It bothers me when people get too affluent 
because when people get too affluent, usually they don't need anything and they don't need God, even Christians. It bothers me when we don't lift Him up as we ought to lift Him up and honor Him as we ought to honor Him. We're living in a sad day, and unless we wake up, we're headed for trouble. I get in my car on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and I drive to church. I drive to church every single day, and I pass by church after church after church with steeples on the front and on the top of the building and with a name out front. And yet that doesn't mean much to a lot of folk. You know what I saw today as I came to church? I saw men working today as if it was just the same as Monday just the same as Tuesday, just the same as Friday. There was no difference that this was the Lord's day. It made no difference to them that this was the day that Jesus rose from the dead. And they went out to labor and to work. Now, don't misunderstand me. I understand that if you work for a company and if you work for a boss and he says you've got to work, I understand that. That's not, that's not in my mind. That's not in my thinking. But what is in my mind and my thinking, if you can go to the house of God and you go away from the house of God on Sunday, you've dishonored Him. And maybe it's because you've become too familiar with Him. When I was in Japan, I asked the people there, uh, some of the people that could speak uh, English, and I said, do the Japanese set Sunday aside? They said, absolutely not. We work seven days a week. Same thing in other countries that I, that I have visited. Uh, Sunday means nothing. England, other places, Sunday means nothing. We've got to that point in this country where serving God doesn't mean anything anymore. We've become too familiar. And what's happening? We're going to cut ourselves off from His blessings. Look, you that have been a member of this church since I've been here as your pastor, you know that I'm not a legalist. And you know that I am not against you taking a vacation. I'm not against you getting away and relaxing and resting with your family. There's nothing wrong with that at all. As a matter of fact, you're a better person for that if you spend time for, with your family. But you know what we're doing now in our country? There's always something else to do. Thanksgiving, we've got to be somewhere else. Christmas, we've got to be somewhere else. We've got to go see the trees when they change. We've got to go here. We've got to go there. And the church will be the last thing on our list rather than number one. Everything else takes precedence over the Son of God. And that's what these people said. We don't have time for Him. Notice three things out of this passage of Scripture this morning. Without honor in His own country. Number one, notice that they fail to accept His Lordship. It doesn't matter that he was a son of Mary. It doesn't matter that he was a craftsman. It doesn't matter that he was with them. John the Baptist had said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. God the Father had spoke from heaven and said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye Him. And it had been announced by more than two witnesses, that He was the Son of God. Accept Him as your Messiah. Accept Him as your Lord. And they said, no, we will not do so. And the Bible says they fell away from Him. We want to be our own Lord. We want to be our own Master. We want to be in charge. No one's going to tell me how to live. No one's going to tell me how to walk. Uh, I'll go to church if I want to. I'll read the Bible if I want to. I'll do whatever I want to do. I'm the leader. I'm the master of my soul. By the way, if you think that's freedom, that's bondage. Real freedom is bowing down before our Heavenly Father and saying, Lord, Thy will be done. I put you first in every single thing that I do. Now watch. They would not listen to His words and yet he spoke with authority. As a matter of fact, uh, to them in this passage of Scripture here, he was trying to speak to their heart, but they would not listen, even though others had said, this man speaks with authority, not as the scribes. And they wouldn't listen to his words. Same thing's true today. How many people do you know of that put the Word of God 
as their authority in their life over every other voice that's coming around, that's coming down the pack. They would not listen to his wisdom. They would not listen to the insight that he had. Yes, the kingdom was offered to them. And yes, if they would have accepted him, the kingdom would have been set up. But they rejected him, and these people rejected him. They would not listen to his works. Now watch. These very same people had experienced his power over demons, his power over disease, his power over death. But they said, we will not listen to to this man. They were too familiar with him. Now watch. As a result, it was reflected in their life in three ways. Number one, their worship. They wouldn't worship him. Now if you don't worship God, you'll worship something. If you don't worship God, you'll worship someone. Someone else will be your God. Someone else will be your Lord. You will be a slave to someone else or something else. And there are some of you sitting here this morning that experience that, and you know that, and you say amen to it right away. And so here it manifested itself in their worship. And yet they were told to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth, and they failed to do so. It showed up in their prayer life. There was no power. No power at all and no answers to prayer. And then it showed up in their speech. They would not honor him. Put down secondly, they failed to accept his message. Can you imagine this? If there was ever a place that ought to honor a citizen or to honor someone of their own, it should have been these people. But they would not do so. They failed to accept his lordship. They failed to accept his message. Now, in the Bible, Jesus only marveled at two things. Now think with me for a moment. God Himself? What would it take for God to marvel? He's seen it all. He's heard it all. He created it all. He created all of us. And yet the Bible said Jesus marveled at two things. One, great faith. And two, unbelief. Do you think he still marvels at those two things? I think he does. When he sees great faith in his children, he marvels at that. He's thrilled at that. When he sees our great faith, how is your faith this morning? How is my faith this morning? But he also marveled at their unbelief. And because of that, the Bible said he could do very few miracles. Now listen to me. Men will not be saved who refuse to be. I want you to go back, if you will, to Mark chapter 3. Just go back a few verses, a few chapters. Here's a very interesting passage of Scripture. You know, we ought to give the gospel to every creature. And I understand what the Bible says, that no man can come to God except my Father draw him. I know that. But listen to this. In Mark 3, look at verse 1. And he entered again into the synagogue, and there was a man there which had a withered hand. And they watched him. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine the heart of these men, the unbelief of these men? They were watching him not because they were concerned for anyone or that they wanted to know the truth, but they were watching because they wanted to trip him up. Watch. Whither he would heal him on the Sabbath day that they might accuse him. And he saith unto the man which had the withered hand, Stand forth. And he saith unto them, Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days? or to do evil, to save life, or to kill. But they held their peace. Now look at verse 5. But when he had looked around about them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their heart, he saith unto the man, Stretch forth thine hand. Now wait a minute. A man with a withered hand can't stretch forth his hand. Have you got that? Here's a man with a withered hand. Jesus said, stretch it forth. He can't do it. The only difference is this. He believed what Jesus told him. His faith, he believed in the Word of God. And the Bible said, he stretched forth his hand because of the power of God. And his withered hand was healed because of his faith. 
Jesus could have done these great miracles in his hometown, but they would not allow him to, but because of unbelief and the hardness of their heart and too familiar with him. Stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it out. And his hand was restored as the other. You may be here today and you're as lost as can be. Did you know you can't come to God unless he draws you? But if he draws you, then he'll give you the faith you need to come to him. And then you'll be saved forever and forever and forever. What a great thought. But yet, this could not happen here. You see, there can be no successful preaching in an atmosphere of hate. Do you know why there are countries in this world right now that will not allow a preacher to preach the gospel on the streets because of the hatred, the wickedness of man's heart? And God has turned them over to their own belief, their own unbelief. You know what God's wrath is? God's wrath is letting you have what you want. And around the world there are people who God has given them up to their own desires. And you try to go preach there and only a handful of people get saved. There are some places that you just seem to like hey, you have no success. I was speaking to Brother Tom Porner. Brother Tom Porner lives down in Athens, Alabama. A good friend of mine. A missionary to Bath, England. And when Brother Porner went to England, I asked him, I said, uh, what success are people having in England now as far as people being saved? He said, very little. Very little. Because of the atmosphere, the hatred against the truth of the Word of God. But yet in Bath, England, Brother Porner is now pastoring a church of over 60 English men and women. There are places where God will save, but there are places where there's hate for the Word of God that God has written Ichabod and has said, because of that, I'll let you have what you want. And that's what he did here in this place. And then there can be no successful preaching in an atmosphere, a wrong atmosphere. Let's bring that to the United States of America. Jesus came to his home. His hometown. He wanted to heal people. He wanted to preach the gospel. But he could not because of their unbelief, because of the wrong attitude toward him, because of a wrong spirit. And I'm going to tell you something this morning. In our churches in America right now, you know why a lot of people are not being saved? Because of the wrong atmosphere in churches. Church people just don't care anymore. They don't care about people getting saved. They don't care. They've been where they are for so long. Now, don't, please don't get me wrong. I love our church. I love this community. I love Raleigh. I've lived here a lot, a long time. I like it here. But I want to tell you something. Did you know that when the paper came out and said that Raleigh, North Carolina is one of the most affluent cities in America and one of the most educated cities in America, that says something good in one way, but it says something bad in another. You can be too educated. And you can be too affluent. I have everything that I need. I look at the big house I live in. Look at the cars that I drive. Look at the money that I have. I don't have any worries about anything. Now I'll just go out and enjoy life and do what I want to do. Like the rich man. Eat, drink, and be merry. Without any thought for God. Without any thought for Him. Without any thought of lifting Him up at all. Then let's come to the last thing. They forfeited His blessings upon them. They forfeited his blessings upon them. Wanted to bless them, couldn't do it because of their unbelief, because of the way they treated him. Now, you remember back in chapter 5, do you remember the woman with an issue of blood? And do you remember she said, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be healed. And she was. What a great miracle took place. Amen? Do you remember while Jesus was on his way to heal a little girl, this woman stopped him. And Jesus is on his way to raise a little girl from the dead. After he healed the woman, he went to the house 
The little girl was healed, but why was she healed? Because a father had a humble, contrite, broken heart. When people are humbled before God, when they are prostrate and contrite before Him, when they prostrate themselves before Him, God can do a marvelous work. But when individual hearts are hard or when a collection of people's hearts are hard, you're not going to see many mighty works. Back in the Old Testament, God told the children of Israel, you know, you need to have your hard ground plowed up. I can't do anything on hard ground. In the spring, when I was a boy on the farm back in Tennessee, my dad would tell me, I want you to get the bog and the disc and I want you to go to what we call the back 40 and see if you can do anything with that ground up there. We had two 20-acre tracks up there. And I would get up there with that bog and I would cut that ground up, try to cut it up with that thing. It was so hard. Run a horror over it, then come back in with a plow and try to plow it up and still maybe only get that much down into the ground. We never had much of a crop there. And then Dad would say to me after that, now they go down to the sand field and get it ready for whatever. Down on the south end of our farm, and we'd go down, and all it took was a disc. No plow, no bog, no hire, just a disc. And I'd go through that thing, and that disc, that ground was so fallow, it was so soft that you could just take that disc and that disc would sometimes bog down because the ground was so soft. Every year our greatest harvest always came from that field. You know why? It was pliable. It was ready for seed to germinate and gave forth a great yield. There are some people who every year Every year, God knocks at their heart. God knocks at their life. He wants to use them. But their heart is just like this podium, hard as a brick. No fruit. And then there are people who are contrite and humble. They prostrate themselves before the Lord, and fruit just flows. They panicked. When he came, they were shocked when he came. They said, we're not going to have anything to do with you. We know you. They were too familiar with him. They made an error in judgment. The error caused them to dishonor him. And because they dishonored him, they lost his blessings. Many years ago, in the office of the president of Harvard University, a couple walked in. She had on an, an old gingham dress and he had on a pair of blue jeans with what we used to call tennis shoes. He said to the secretary, we'd like to see the president of Harvard University. She looked at their clothes and looked at them and she said, well, the president is very busy and he'll probably be busy all day long. And he said, well, we'll wait. And about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, she said, well, the president has decided to see you. The couple walked into the office of the president of Harvard University. And they said, sir, our son died here as a freshman. We want to do something to honor him. We want to build a monument. To him. The president said, we just can't have tombstones all over Harvard University. And the mother spoke up and said, no, sir, that's not what I mean. We want to build a building in his honor. And the president of Harvard University said, well, you know, we have buildings worth thousands of dollars. We really don't need another building. 
the gentleman spoke up and said, Well, sir, how much money does it take to build a university? And the president said, Well, about seven million. The wife said, Well, honey, let's just go build our own. So Mr. and Mrs. Leland Stanford got on a plane and flew to Palo Alto, California and built Stanford University in honor of their son who died as a freshman at Harvard. An educated man made a misjudgment and lost millions of dollars that Harvard University could have enjoyed because he looked at an old man and an old woman in tattered clothes and thought they had nothing and they had millions. And show you how you can be saved and how you can know it. Then, are you here this morning and you're a believer? Maybe you've just become too familiar with church, with the Bible, with the songs of Zion. You've heard it for so long, you've been in it for so long, and yet you're Break up the fallow ground, break up the hard ground, make it soft and pliable and you need to come and say, Lord, I turn myself over completely to you, would you come? And then maybe you'd like to unite with our church by letter, by statement, by baptism, I know not. But whatever your need is this morning, Jesus is passing your way. Just like he came to Nazareth, he's here this morning. He wants to do business with you, he wants to do business with me. Heavenly Father, this is your invitation. Your word's been given. Your songs have been sung. It's time for the invitation. Lord, melt hearts and help us to respond to your message. Lord, you know the hearts that need to respond. I pray you'll speak to each one. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Our men are here at the front to help.